The Nevada desert is part of America's nuclear history. Since the 1950s, it's been the primary location for the testing of atomic bombs. Now, beneath this hot, desolate land, authorities plan to store 70,000 tonnes of radioactive nuclear waste. Yucca Mountain was chosen uh, by Congress um, in 1987, what has come to be known as the Screw Nevada Bill, which uh, essentially narrowed the site selection process to a single site. I happen to think they picked the technically right program when they made the decision, but you can't deny that it was a political decision to pick Yucca Mountain as the one site the U.S. is studying right now. Politics is influencing the fate of Yucca Mountain, and it's also driving the biggest changes in the U.S. nuclear industry in a generation. 103 nuclear power plants now supply 20% of the nation's electricity. But the government wants more, declaring that nuclear power has a key role to play in solving the country's energy crisis and reducing greenhouse gases. No nuclear power plants have been built here in the United States for almost 30 years, but the president wants to change all that. He says nuclear energy is clean, affordable and safe. And with huge financial backing from the government, the big power companies want a piece of the action. But what does this nuclear renaissance mean for people who live near the plants? Port Gibson on the mighty Mississippi River in America's deep south, home of the blues. The music of Bobby Rush has its origins in this region's history of slavery and discrimination, and the people here are still doing it tough. Eighty-three percent of this community is African American, and more than thirty percent live below the poverty line. Since 1985, Port Gibson has been home to the Grand Gulf Nuclear Power Plant, run by the Entergy Corporation. It is the only real non-emitting source of power that's really available to our country in any kind of scalable size. The head of Entergy's right. nuclear division, Gary Taylor, wants a second plant up and running in Port Gibson within a decade. It would be the first nuclear plant commissioned in the U.S. since the Three Mile Island accident in Pennsylvania in 1979, an event which shattered public confidence in nuclear power and put the industry on hold. I think nuclear power in this country is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's going to expand. I think the issues of global warming, the issues of energy security uh, are so large that we have to come to a, a way to deal with the issues that do concern people. This power plant is going to be set up power to everybody in the United States of America, not oh. just Mississippi. Okay. It's oh. going to be to everybody. For Mayor Amelda Arnold, the economic benefits of a second power plant are the big selling point. Because see, this power plant here, the new one, is going to be different than the one we have right now. This community, we don't have a lot of jobs here. Our energy is probably one of your your highest paying, you know, companies here, you know, in, in the Cleveland County area. It is the highest, let, let me say not one, it is the highest in this area. And, uh, you know, they offer good service. It's a, it's a very, very efficiently safe ran plant. And, you know, we're just, you know, just excited, you know, to have them here. We didn't know what a nuclear power plant was until one came here. Lenora Dotson, who's lived in Port Gibson all her life, doesn't share the mayor's enthusiasm. Do you remember what people thought about it when it was new? No, they was interested in getting a job. And what we thought, we thought when the plant came in here, it was more for the citizens of Claiborne County instead of the outside people. But it seemed as though more people outside the county have better jobs down there than the citizens here in Claiborne County. Hello! 
AC Garner runs a small farm in Port Gibson, but he has strong links with the power plant. Do you think the community has much say in terms of the power plant? The community does not really have uh, a whole lot to say. The government of, of, of Claiborne County, the state of Mississippi, and the federal government is the ones who have the say so of whether or not a nuclear power plant comes here. For 14 years, A.C. Garner was Director of Emergency Management at Grand Gulf, and he has real concerns about what would happen if something went wrong at the plant. For example, at one time we had five fire stations operating here in Cleveland County. Now we only have one, okay? Uh, once upon a time we had the Cleveland County Hospital that was operating and uh, really functioning and so forth. It's not functioning very well out there now. That's with one plant. With the second plant coming in, you could have twice as many problems and concerns as you'd have now. The Assistant Chief of Police, Terence Watson, agrees. In an emergency, he would be relying on a staff of eight people. Would you like more people here? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. But have, you, have you asked for more? We've asked, but with being a rural department, it's, it's just not feasible at this time, you know. Money is not there to um, hire extra people right now, you know. But it's something that needs to be looked into because of the plant itself. Officer Clinton Robinson says he worries about an accident every day. Yes, I, I think about it all the time. I was out patrolling because of the radiation, you know, it can go off, you know. Some of the people is not aware of the situation. It's not educated on it and everything. Uh, it can be a big disaster at any time. Environmental racism is alive and well in Claiborne County. Paul Gunter from the Nuclear Information and Resources Service believes the people of Port Gibson are being taken advantage of. They've clearly chosen Claiborne County because of the political sway that they can hold over that very weak government and very vulnerable financially government, uh, rather than going up to, say, Westchester County, where the people have political savvy up there. Westchester County on the Hudson River in New York State is a very different community with a much stronger voice. And organize the fight. The power of the people will bright up the night. And if we're the Indian Point power plant, also owned by Entergy, is less than 50 kilometers from Manhattan. Locals want it closed down and have the funds and the knowledge to launch a concerted campaign. We're very well organized. We have a coalition, the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition, which has 70 groups working together in harmony to close down the Indian Point nuclear power plant. It is disgraceful that we are handing on this toxic legacy to our children. Maybe it is safe, I mean, by, by their standard, but you know, I don't think it's safe from an attack or safe from uh, just uh, the ravages of time and you know what's going to happen with the waste. Well, we're trying to organize in New York City and print there and, and get the city council. The aim this weekend is to gather 5,000 signatures on a petition to present to Congress calling for the closure of Indian Point. And if they can't fix it, they should shut it. It was built in the early 1970s, so it's close. It's over 30 years old now. Um, all three reactors now are at least 30 years old. Uh, Lawyer Phil Musagas works for the Hudson River Environmental Group Riverkeeper. Its 7,000 members are funding a series of legal challenges. We think it's, it's very dangerous. There are security issues, there are safety issues with the operation of the plant. Uh, there's uh, problems with the emergency evacuation plan. It simply will not work. So uh, I think all these things in combination make it uh, a really high level of risk. And we have 300,000 people living within 10 miles of the plant. We have 20 million people within 50 miles. So we think it's a risk we just shouldn't, shouldn't be taking. On September the 11th, 2001, one of the hijacked planes heading for New York City flew directly over this area. 
The commission into the attacks found that Al-Qaeda was investigating nuclear power plants as possible targets. Indian Point is, you know, is the most highly visible plant in the country. So, I mean, you, you have to consider that they, would have, they, were, they were thinking of targeting it. And there's no reason to think they're not still targeting it now. As far as energy is concerned, it's a non-issue. If you look at it from a security point of view, it's the most hardened facility you'll find in that area. In addition to that, the, the state has National Guard there, as well as uh, patrols in the Hudson River. It's probably the most offended uh, asset in the state of New York, if not in the whole United States. And, and I just don't see that as, as a problem. I, I, I really don't. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, no doubt the U.S. wants to reduce its dependence on oil and cut down greenhouse gas emissions, but the question is, why nuclear and why now? Nuclear power is abundant and affordable. In other words, you have nuclear power plants, you can say we've got an abundant amount of electricity. Nuclear power helps us protect the environment. And nuclear power is safe. There are far safer, cheaper, cleaner, more secure ways of generating electricity in the, in the 21st century rather than going back to an antiquated and failed system of the 1950s. Paul Gunter believes the nuclear revival is more about politics and money than finding an answer to environmental and energy needs. The nuclear power industry is, is one of the most influential political action committees on Capitol Hill and in the White House today. Decisions are being influenced by, by money more than they are by a sound technology. The U.S. government's 2005 energy bill provides billions of dollars in subsidies and tax breaks to the nuclear industry. Companies which build the first plants will have 50% of their costs covered by the public purse. If you look at the issues that we've had uh, in the past, long delays because of intervention, rising interest rates, many things that destroyed a great deal of shareholder value, uh, what well, we had told the government in order to have access to the capital market, to allow us to go borrow money, that they're going to have to have some certainty of how do we deal with those risks, at least for the first few plants. This industry would not even be thinking about new construction were it not for the U.S. government pulling the U.S. taxpayer out underneath these projects as a safety net. Uh, in fact, our taxpayer dollars are the only thing that promotes the concept of new construction. Subsidies for nuclear are no larger than subsidies for any other source of electricity generation in the United States. Mary um, Quillian the, from the industry's lobbying arm on Capitol Hill, the Nuclear Energy Institute, defends its technology and its politics. But the fact is, in the last five years, the nuclear power industry has contributed more than 50 million dollars to political campaigns. All energy sources in the United States have lobbying firms in Washington um, and do their part to ensure that their type of energy uh, is fairly treated and considered in the political system in the United States. And I think politicians are savvy enough to know that they have to be able to support any decisions they make with strong economic numbers as well as scientific numbers. But as the talk focuses on building more power plants, the industry still hasn't resolved the problem of what to do long term with the waste it's already created. At the Grand Gulf plant in Mississippi, the pool is near capacity, so the company must build a dry storage facility. Would you prefer to store that waste away from here? Of course. I mean, all, if you were to ask any of the executives across the country, they would prefer to store the waste in the long-term facility that we all expected to be ready by now. So what's happening at Yucca Mountain, the site selected in 1987 as the best location for the permanent underground storage of nuclear waste? We're on the Nevada test site, which is the location where the United States has tested its nuclear weapons. We're about, right now we're about 85 miles from Las Vegas. 
Our guide is technical engineer Michael Vogel, who's been part of this project from the beginning. We're about 30 metres deep right here. About one and a half to two kilometres down the, down the track is where the actual repository area would start. The project is way behind schedule. After 20 years and $7 billion, all that's been built is an access tunnel to allow scientists to study the site. An application hasn't yet been lodged to start work on the storage areas. And when was it expected to be ready? When was, was the industry <clears throat> promised, if you like? Yeah, the, the promises, if you will. The dates in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was 1998 for the first repository to be operational. And you're talking now about 2016? Um, those, that, I mean, um, that's what it comes out to be, unfortunately, about 10 years from now. And this city is one of the reasons for the delay. When Yucca Mountain was first proposed, Las Vegas was a small town with little political clout. Now it's a thriving tourist attraction with a lot to lose. And the state of Nevada is waging a spirited legal battle to stop the development. Last year, there were 39 million tourists who came through the airport in Las Vegas. Anything having to do with nuclear waste and Las Vegas is an immediate downturn in the economy with absolutely no way to predict what recovery might be. And that's just way too much of a risk to take when we don't have to take it. Geologist Steve Frischman is an advisor to the state of Nevada. In his view, the main problem with Yucca Mountain is that it's porous. Yucca Mountain is incapable of isolating the waste because it's so fractured up, water moves through it, and water will transport the waste to water that is, already, that is now being used for humans and agriculture. We did not encounter water when we, when we excavated this tunnel. The, the, the difficult issue is projecting what's going to happen 10,000 years in the future, 100,000 years in the future, several hundred thousand years in the future. Both sides in this debate will get the chance to have their say in the next stage of the process, when the Department of Energy applies for a license to build the underground storage area. Russia may provide an alternative waste depot for the United States, but the search is on for other sites. Australia says it won't be a dumping ground, but Paul Gunter has a word of warning. If you go down the atomic path by generating nuclear waste at nuclear power stations, Australia could very well find itself being the the Pangea for nuclear waste from all over the world that threatens not only current generations but generations far, far, far into the future with this 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 far, 